watching the video sermon podcast of First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas. For almost 130 years, FBCMF has served Marble Falls and the Greater Highland Lakes area faithfully through children's programs, youth activities, and adult discipleship. We invite you to join us each and every Sunday morning at 9 and 10.30 a.m. for deep fellowship, rich worship, and a spirit-filled message. For those who find themselves unable to attend on a Sunday morning, we stream those services. Simply visit fbcmf.live during either of our service times to view it. Never miss an archived sermon by subscribing to this podcast on YouTube by visiting youtube.com forward slash fbcmftube. And to learn more about our church or to listen to an audio-only version of this and other sermons, please visit us online at fbcmf.org. Um, before we begin, the, there are certain leaders in our community that have been pouring out their lives um, in wonderful leadership, trying to help all of the community come together to respond to the floods. Some of them might even be here this morning. And, uh, and if you are, if, if you would allow us, we would just love to not just welcome you, but to recognize who you are and your contribution to helping our community to be healthy again and to heal from the floods that, uh, that's come to our area. And so I just wanna introduce you to these people and if they're not here, that's okay. But when you see them around the community, please uh, look them up and tell them thank you. But if they're here, we'd love for you to stand up and we would just love to give you a moment of gratitude and thanks um, from our heart. Um, our mayor, John Packer, our city manager, Mike Hodge, our police chief, Mark Whitaker, our fire chief, Russell Sander, the Marble Falls EMS um, director, Kevin Nauman, and, uh, and I'll say something special about Kevin Nauman. Um, Kevin Nauman has been the man who's in charge of the entire county, Burnett County's um, disaster relief operations. He's pulled everyone together. Y'all really, he's done a fantastic job. I've never seen better leadership from anyone than Kevin Nauman. Burnett County Sheriff's Department, Calvin Boyd. Our County Commissioner, Joe Don Dockery. Our Judge, James Oakley our Highland Lakes Legacy Fund leader, Donna Klager, and our own state representative, Terry Wilson, as well. Y'all, thank you so much for what you have done. Continue to pray for our leaders as they engage our federal government and FEMA, trying to allow our area to be recognized as a disaster area. Um, even if they're not here, would y'all just help me, because some of them may be watching online. We just want to give them a hand and thank them for what they have done. Thank you. Well, y'all, this is Missions Month, and, uh, and I'm excited about it. it. This is the time when we um, focus all of our attention on other people. Now, you, you might think, well, Ross, we do that all year long, and, and that's true, but, but this is a very unique and intentional November where where we allow the Holy Spirit to ignite inside of ourselves the, the love for our neighbor that we may have uh, missed some at some point during the year. We desire for the Holy Spirit to renew in us the love and the excitement that we have to minister to people all through our area. And so this month we pray for it, we desire it as we examine the prevalent passages of scripture that teach us to keep our heads up and our eyes open and to engage people around us. Um, that the kingdom of God is not only about what happens inside of this room, that we are here to do something very intentional in the lives of everyone, both globally, as y'all saw in the video, through Honduras and in Thailand and Africa and our global mission projects, but locally, that we believe right here in the Highland Lakes area, God has planted us here for a very special purpose. The savior of our world said, love your neighbor as yourself, and that is the theme for our missions month. And, and I'd like to share with you two stories, and I wanna compare both of them for a moment. During the floods, when we opened our, our church up as a shelter, there was a 91-year-old man who came in. He, he lost his home, which was down over on Elizabeth Drive, which is about a mile from where you're sitting and in, uh, as you're going to Cottonwood Shores. 
he came in and he sat on one of our couches for two days straight and, uh, and, and we had several members, just their hearts kind of drew them to him and they would have conversations with one another. And, 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 and I wanna share with you uh, one of the stories that, that Dr. Rusty Freeman um, uh, experienced as he and several others began to engage this particular man. And, uh, and so Rusty has shared it with us. Uh, he and his wife are in um, uh, another state, and so they shared it with us on video. And so here's their story about this man. Good morning, church. On Tuesday, the day of the flood, I was at the church when we opened as a shelter. A few hours after being there, I met Phil Weintraub. Phil, who I learned later, was a 91-year-old widow, widower who lived in Marble Falls, but who was affected by the flood. It was my pleasure to meet him along with, and to minister to him along with Ginger Shooter, Tammy Berkman, Russell Roberts, and many others who loved on this sweet man. I saw him on Tuesday. Came back on Wednesday and he was still there. He was frail and I knew that this had been a traumatic event for him. So the Lord led me to help uh, put him into Gateway Gardens, an assisted living center just across from the church, just across 281. Uh, it was the Lord's leading and it was incredible, uh, incredible moment to, to be able to do that. I took him to Walmart, helped him shop helped uh, reveal and show the love of Jesus Christ to this man, Phil. I had a team from another church and another community come in and help work and clean his house and, and remove all the, the mold from his house. And it was um, a, a wonderful event. At that time, uh, I worked with Phil and he was uh, not a believer. He questioned my faith and uh, question the proof that I had for the existence of God. I didn't preach to him with words, but I loved him and he knew that I was a pastor and I loved him. And, and with Tammy Berkman continuing on a daily basis to visit him and, and with me working with him, the, the team that cleaned out his home, we were to fill the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. So I just want to say thank you uh, to First Baptist Church for opening up your your. The this, this space there at the church to be a shelter and for being the hands and the feet of Christ. You are making a difference in this community and throughout the Highland Lakes area, and I just thank you for that. Uh, God bless you and take care. All right. I want you to keep this story in your mind, and now I want you to hear another story. In Long Beach, California, um, a couple of months ago in August, there was a man who went on the metro uh, train. And when he had gotten on, he began to have a seizure. There was a man in a suit, and, uh, and he went over to him, and the man having a seizure had fallen down, and the businessman goes over to him, and uh, the few people who are on the train immediately think that, that he's going to, to help him, to, to respond to him kind of the way that, that Dr. Rusty Freeman responded to the man who was sitting out here. That was their expectation. And so this businessman goes up to the guy having the seizure and, uh, and some people began to record it. And what he says to him is, um, you're making everybody late on the train. And as soon as the train came to a stop and the doors open, the businessman grabbed the man that was having a seizure by the feet and drug him off of the train. And, uh, and said to him one more time, you're making everybody late. The man in the suit got back on the train and the train left. So what I'm trying to do is, is give you two stories in opposition to one another. Now, it, it may be true that you and I never know exactly what we're going to do when a moment of truth comes um, to love our neighbor. But, but if you're going to respond when your moment comes, more like the first story that you heard rather than like the second. What are you going to do right now to prepare your heart, to prepare your mind, so that you end up acting more like the first story? I think that there are things we can do so that we end up looking more like what Rusty did rather than this businessman. And I wanna to submit to you that there are several practices that you can implement in your life about loving your neighbor so that when, not if, but when this moment comes to your door, 
you'll be able to respond in it and not just drag somebody outside. And, and here are the three practices. I, I wanna share with you that, it, that first we have to practice why. Um, we start with why. Uh, and, and, and then once we move past that, there is the practice of opening our eyes and noticing the needs that are around us. And then the last thing is we practice the small moments of sacrifice that the Lord gives us opportunity to engage people physically and practically, and we engage the small moments. So, so first, think with me for a moment about the practice of why. Um, Jesus talked extensively about how the Christian life is a life that looks outward rather than inward. In the context of the passage of scripture in Matthew 22, um, there's this lawyer or an expert in the law and he comes to Jesus and asks him, what is the greatest of all the commandments? Now, the, the, there are groups of people in Jesus' um, world, Pharisees, um, Jewish religious leaders, Sadducees, another group of Jewish religious leaders. They're very different from one another, but the one thing they both have in common is neither of them like Jesus. The Pharisees hear that Jesus has, has um, beaten the Sadducee group in, in debates and uh, he's, he's hard to trap and so they get one of their guys to go up and trap him and, uh, and, and scholars believe that these passages are called entrapment narratives. So in this particular entrapment narrative, another uh, pitcher steps up to try to strike Jesus out and the Pharisees send their best pitcher up and, and then the Sadducees send their best pitcher up and here is this one expert in the law that comes from the camp of the Pharisee group and he's gonna try and strike Jesus out and he asks him the question of all the commandments, which one do you think is the greatest commandment? Okay, there are 613 commandments from God in the Torah. 613, and it was the, the passion of Jewish scholars to try to arrange all 613 as to which one was the most important to the least important to create a hierarchy of all of the law. And, and it was a labor of love, and they debated this and talked about it. They, they, they really worked at it because if you were going to fail in, in regard to one of the um, commandments, they did not want to fall in the greatest commandment. They, they, they would much rather mess up in one of the smaller ones. And so they continued to try to figure out, well, which ones are the greatest? And so he goes to Jesus and he's asking him a very common question. He's saying, Jesus, engage this debate with us. Which commandment of the 613 would you put at the very pinnacle of all of them? And then they just stand there and they're listening, they're on edge, because Jesus' answer is about to be monumental. Which one is the greatest? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. And then, without hardly even pausing, he says, but there is another one that is a mirror image to that one, and I cannot leave it off, and even though you asked for one, I must give you two. The other one is exactly like it, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. And y'all, that's a new teaching. All of these, this time when they would debate these 613, never once did they put something like this up with the very highest one. Loving your neighbor is yourself, and that being up there with loving God, th th this is new, this changes stuff. It changes how we live. Everything is now different. If what Jesus is saying is right, then this radically moves religion and, um, and how the Jews felt about people in a very different direction. Jesus just took how we treat other people and y'all, he puts it on par with loving God. And so if loving your neighbor is like loving God, then you can't be mean to somebody and you definitely cannot um, be indifferent to a group of people's suffering and at the same time say that you love God. You don't love God. That's the point. Um, now forever, they, they, they separated these two things where people could actually say, I love God, but I don't like that person. And Jesus is putting all of this together. Now, it's important because 
What we're trying to get at is the why. Why love your neighbor as yourself? And the reason is because Jesus elevates loving your neighbor as yourself to loving God. That's as high as it can go. That is huge. And Jesus does this because, number one, everybody that we see is created in the image of God. C.S. Lewis said that if somehow you were able to see somebody and how they would be in heaven, that, that, that the dullest, um, uh, the, 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 the least attractive person that you have ever seen, if you were to see them how they would be one day in heaven with an eternal body, that you would be tempted to bow down and worship them and think that they were a God, created in God's image, that all races, that all people have this kind of thing. And because of that, Jesus is saying, love your neighbor as yourself because it's like the first one. But it's not only that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus wants us to do that because somehow in loving somebody, they're able to also know that God loves them. They're, we're able to share with them that there is a God who cares about them because very often in this life, it feels like you're left alone. And so to know that God loves you through other people is remarkable. But Jesus also says this because, y'all, is, is, is there a chance that by loving your neighbor, we are able to create a society of peace rather than a society of violence and a society of war or a society of racism, a society that, 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 that is very regressive, that, that when you engage a human being that is a neighbor and you engage them well with the love of God, then maybe you are a part of a catalyst that helps create a society of shalom and peace all around you. You see, this is the why. And how do we practice it? How do you practice the why? I, I wanna suggest that we, we practice it doing first exactly what we're doing right now. We take the word of God and we study it. And we see these, these passages of loving other people begin to arise and come out of it. And as we study the Bible, we study it in a way that we try to see ourselves living it out. We don't study the Bible as a, as a cognitive kind of intellectual thing, but we study it in a way that we see ourselves being transformed by it and begin to live out the truths that it teaches us. And so we start to use our imagination that we, we play out the moments that the Bible talks about loving others as if it's us who are there when you read Luke chapter 10 and the parable of the Good Samaritan, you, you read it with a sense of imagination that, that you're the ones who choose to stop and help somebody and, and, and give them what they need and you pay it out of your own pocket and you help them out of your own imagination. You start to see yourself in the place of Zacchaeus who stands up and says, if I have cheated anybody, I'm gonna pay back four times the amount and I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor. You start to see yourself in your own imagination. You do Bible study in a way that, that, that you start to live it and it becomes you moments where you give in moments where you sacrifice. And so loving our neighbor begins to take root in our, in our mind and in our imagination. And, and that's how we study God's word. And so we practice why in studying God's word and seeing ourselves in it. But then, y'all, we, we, we sing these songs and we sing them over and over again and we practice the why when you sing songs like the hymn, Rescue the Perishing, or the hymn, Send the Light, one of our newer songs that I, I love. I think it's one of the best songs. If, if Dory is in here, uh, praise team, I think it's one of the best songs that we do because the theology is fantastic, and it's Build Your Kingdom Here. Dang, I love it. That is a great song. I like it also because sometimes I get to play that cool instrument, you know, and, and uh, but y'all, build your kingdom here. In the second verse, did y'all know that it takes this great commandment to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbors yourself, and it puts it all together in one verse? Listen to the verse. In, in build your kingdom here, the second verse goes like this. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives, for you are our joy and prize. That's love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind. That's it. But then it follows it up with this line. To see 
the captive hearts released. See, now it's starting to look outside. The hurt, the sick, and the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for that cause. See, it moves from from loving God to loving people. And so it puts all of it together. That song conveys all of this, and every time we sing it, every time you sing this, you begin to be transformed little bit by little bit by little bit of the why that we love our neighbor. So we practice it with our Bible studies. We practice it with our songs. Y'all, every time we do the Lord's Supper, we're practicing it. Because in the Lord's Supper, we don't just focus on us and God, but, but, but we do it as community with one another. We do the Lord's Supper in such a way that we invite other people to come to the table of the Lord with us. And and we share with one another throughout the whole thing. And this is an exciting way to have the Lord's Supper. And, and, And it conveys that it's not just about us, that it is about community and about others. And so we practice it in all of these things. And we come to the conclusion at the end of practicing it in our Bible studies, in our liturgy, in our songs, in our Lord's Supper, in our worship, over and over we finally arrive at the conclusion that biblical Christianity um, that does not engage people outside of us is not authentic Christianity. That there is something messed up and wrong with it that real Christians engage people and sacrifice for them. So y'all, we practice it in our Bible studies and in our songs and our theology over and over again. But that's not the only practice. There's this amazing practice of picking your head up and not just focusing on your own life when you leave this place and beginning to see other people and how they live and who they are. We become profoundly aware of people's needs. And if we'll just li- be better listeners to people, and if we'll observe them better, and if we're interested in who they are and what they're saying, then what happens is, is what they say will tip us off, and what they do will tip us off as to what their needs are. If we'll listen to them. This is how you love your neighbor. You, you, you practice this idea of listening, and you practice this idea of, of being interested in their life and what they say and what they do, more interested in their story than you are in your own story. Um, Megan and I have a really sweet cousin who's an amazing woman, and, uh, and she's a single woman, and, and several years ago she had a date with uh, a, um, um, a young man who went to seminary, and I was kind of excited about the date because he was coming out of my seminary. And, and I thought, ah, man, you're gonna land a good guy going to my seminary, I'm excited about it. And, uh, and so she, it ended up happening, what ended up happening is it's the worst date she's ever been on. And, uh, and this is what she said, all throughout the date, this guy did nothing but talk about himself and interrupt her as soon as she started to say anything. She said that she would listen and listen to his story and and him go on and on about things, and then as soon as she started to talk about anything, he would say something ridiculous, like he would interrupt her and say, I wonder how many tiles are in this ceiling. (laughs) And he would just interrupt and interrupt over and over again. And she said, finally, the guy recognized what he was doing, and he said, you know what, I keep interrupting. I don't know why I keep doing that. And she goes, I do, and she goes, it's because you feel that what you have to say is more important than what I have to say. And she goes, and he's so self-absorbed that he didn't even know that I just slammed him. (laughs) That's pretty self-absorbed, isn't it? Some people live their life as if they're on that kind of a date, though, as if, everything kind of revolves around them and they don't pick up their head and acknowledge other people and the neighbors who are around them and what other people are going through because they're just so focused on their story and their life or their success or just getting to where they need to go or getting their group. That's, this is big, getting their group where their group needs to go. And so what they do is they don't focus on any other group except themselves. 
They certainly don't hear what other people are trying to say. And what they will do sometimes is, is build a wall, a fortress around their ideas, and they throw stones very quickly at other people's ideas, but that's not the way that you love your neighbor for sure. Some people live as if they're perpetually on a date kind of like that. Jesus uh, said this when, when he was um, with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman in John chapter four, and the disciples came up, and, and this woman was there, and Jesus was ministering to her, and he said to his disciples, um, look and see the harvest. It is ripe, and it is ready. Look to the fields. He's teaching them to have spiritual eyes, that there are these people who are in need and they would love to be ministered to or they would love to have friends or they would love that if we could just pick up our eyes and see some of them. In Matthew 9, 37, Jesus said, um, seeing the people, Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He seized them. So y'all, we practice this idea of seeing people and being interested in their lives, aware of their needs. Alan Williams, the owner of Chick-fil-A, gave me a book entitled The Art of Neighboring. It's a great book, and in it, it suggests that when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, that that is not symbolic, that that is literal. It says that um, what would it be like if you actually loved your particular neighbors who lived around you? Do y'all know your neighbor's names? The neighbor who lives in front of you, behind you, the neighbors who live to the side, do you know their names? Do you know their children's names? Have you engaged their actual life? Um, we need to know the people's names. We need to know who they are because God, God puts us in the middle of a group of people and he doesn't do it just so that when you come home, we can shut our blinds as fast as we can and turn on Netflix and just kind of veg out, being ourselves and just getting away from everybody. He puts us in the middle of all of this group so that we can live, go outside and engage people and have energy and pick up our head and notice and listen to them when they talk, when they arrive and when they leave so that you can care for the people who are around you to know their names. And y'all, the last practice is this. After we practice the why through our Bible studies and songs and theologies and worship, and after we practice looking at people's needs, the very last thing is this. We, we practice actually sacrificing and giving to other people what God gave to us. In Matthew 9, um, the Bible says, seeing the people um, Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then at nighttime, the disciples came and, he, and they said, Jesus, send all of the people away because where are they going to eat? We don't have anything to give them. Send them away to other people. And Jesus responded, why don't you feed them? I think that's an interesting thing. Why don't you feed them? Isn't it easy to put off on other people the love that we should be showing? It's pretty easy to say, well, I'm, I'm sure there's a program for that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the government has a program for that. I'm sure that there's a church that's bigger, that have more resources than us. I'm sure that that church over there maybe can do all of that. I'm sure if the whole community you know, comes together, then, then maybe everybody can do that. Or, or, or I'm sure that there's a family member out there somewhere who can do that. And the whole time we're saying, I'm sure that these other people can do, I'm sure, why don't you send them away, Lord, to these other people? Christ kind of looks at us and, and he says, why, why don't you do it? Are, are you incapable? Well, why don't you, I've picked your head up to notice these things. You're the one, the disciples are the ones that came to Jesus and noticed that they were hungry. They're the ones who said they're gonna go hungry. Why don't we send them away? If they're noticing it, Jesus is saying, why don't y'all do something about this? Love your neighbor. Practice this kind of thing. And y'all, we have discovered something amazing. That, that, that in all of the years of us coming together as a church, when we have stepped out to say, 
We're going to do something about it. Never once has God let us down in that. Never once has there been a moment where we've tried to say we're going to love our neighbor to the best of our ability. Have we run out of all of our resources and we just can't? God has always given us the strength and he's always given us the resources to do it. I have, there's nothing to say that in our future when we engage our neighbors, God isn't going to continue working and giving us the strength and the ability to do this. It's exciting because of that. Now, now here's how I want to end all of this. Loving your neighbor is inconvenient, it's inefficient, and it's insecure. And all of these things, you might say, because of that, it's, it's too big of a risk. It's too big of a risk. I can't engage uh, the, my own security. I can't give away all of these things. I can't do it. But I want to remind you all that to not love your neighbor has consequences too. If somebody thinks, well, if I give all of this, the consequences are what's going to happen to me or what's going to happen to my group, I just want to remind you that to not love your neighbor has consequences as well. There is a German theologian, a great Lutheran pastor named Martin Niemöller during World War II. And he talked about not looking out for the people around him. And at the very beginning of the Holocaust, many Christian Germans were not too alarmed because the Nazis were not coming after them. And, and, and they thought, well, it doesn't really matter to me. The Nazis are going after everybody else. And it's in this context, this context that Martin Niemöller gave one of the most famous quotes that's ever been. Niemöller said this, first, the Nazis came for all of the socialists, but I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. And then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for the trade unionist, and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And finally, they came for me, and there was nobody left to speak out for me. The consequence with an isolationist mindset is simple. When you care mainly about what happens to you, or your interests, or your needs, while the suffering of other people is of little consequence, then eventually their suffering breaks into our nice little bubble. It breaks in. What happens to the people around us does eventually affect us all. So we can either be a loving relational solution on the front end or we can try to pick up all the broken pieces of both their lives and ours on the back end. Those are the only two options. Now, certainly we cannot fix every single problem that our neighbors have. We, we recognize our limitations, and we recognize that we are not the saviors of the world, that, that the Lord's shoulders are bigger than ours. We're not the saviors. And so here is the balance, the balance between being an isolationist on one side and caring mainly for your own self. And way on the other side is having a savior complex that you can do everything with a sense of arrogance and, and, and everyone has to listen and do it our way. Because somewhere in the middle of those two extremes is the loving, quiet voice of Jesus Christ saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if we have not thought about loving our neighbor as ourself beforehand, um, by practicing why, by practicing to keep our head up and notice other people, and by practicing these real moments of sacrifice, then, then when the moment does come to your doorstep, that what you might end up doing is dragging a man with a seizure out of the train and simply saying, you're making us all late. So we practice it, don't we?
You've been watching the video sermon podcast of First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas. Never miss an archived sermon or video posted to our YouTube channel by subscribing to it at youtube.com slash fbcmf2. For more information about our church and to hear an audio-only version of this sermon, please visit us online at fbcmf.org.